There's an invisible killer lurking on almost every street. It holds no mercy for the young, old, fit and healthy, and is killing more people than smoking, car crashes, or HIV and AIDS. I'm talking about air pollution. Around the world, nine out of 10 people breathe unhealthy air. Every year, nearly one in five people die globally from the effects of air pollution created by burning fossil fuels. It's a bleak picture, but one that we can change. They are basically influencing any living organism. So clearly they're influencing public health, our health, and they're influencing even productivity of crops. This is Dr. Frank Kelly. He's an air pollution specialist at London Imperial College. Frank and his team have been researching the cause and effect of air pollution for decades. The main source of air pollution worldwide is the burning of fossil fuels. About 80% of all the pollution comes from that. And that's why you hear so much about having to wait, move away from fossil fuels. And the big one there still is coal. The Industrial Revolution was a huge turning point. Coal came into large-scale use. Mass production led to overproduction, creating a society of throwaway consumerism and amassing what we know as toxic air. Cars became more commonplace. It wasn't until after World War II, once automotive production really started to ramp back up, when the car boom kicked in. Road transport is now a major threat to congestion, climate change and clean air thanks to traffic emissions. In fact, 91% of the world's population now live in places where air quality exceeds World Health Organization guidelines, with around 7 million people dying from the effects of air pollution annually. For the sake of humanity, it's time we got out of the tailpipe polluting vehicles and chose cleaner, greener options. For those who don't want to walk or cycle, electric scooters are a solid alternative to single occupancy car journeys because there's no exhaust pipe for anything to come out of. There's these tiny particles which are produced when you burn anything uh, called particulate matter and it comes in various sizes but the important thing is that even the smallest ones which we worry about are able to enter our airways, enter our lungs and therefore begin to cause health problems. We now know that air quality hugely affects our health. Professor Kelly has observed this firsthand. Many lung diseases such as asthma, such as chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, such as lung cancer. These diseases were associated with the quality of the air or the poor quality of air that people were breathing. After decades of research, the depth of air pollution's hidden costs began to rear its ugly head. Long-term exposure leads to a reduced life expectancy. Children have reduced lung growth, strokes, impaired memory, a reduced ability to learn. Even bipolar and schizophrenia are linked to its impact. The current situation is an understanding that anything that we breathe actually can influence any parts of our body. And it depends on what you're breathing, how much of it you're breathing, and how long you've been breathing it. The world really woke up to the deadly cost of air pollution when in 2020, a landmark inquest ruled that for the first time ever in the UK, air pollution was an associated cause of death to a nine-year-old girl. This was the first of its kind for a coroner report, but sadly, it's not going to be the last. Hey, has the video started? Can I just go and check quickly? Thank you. Ella Kissy Deborah was a young, bright thing that loved to play musical instruments, swam, danced, and had dreams of becoming a pilot. In 2010, when she was just six years old, she was taken to hospital for severe coughing fits. She had to be placed in a medically induced coma for three days to stabilize her condition. By 2012, she was classified as disabled. In 2013, at the age of nine years old, following a severe asthma attack, Ella passed away. In those three years before her death, she had multiple seizures and was admitted to hospital 27 times. Ella lived 25 meters from the South Circular Road in Lewisham, where deadly levels of nitrogen dioxide from heavy traffic polluted the air. So the demographic that's hit hardest by air pollution is unfortunately those in the lower socioeconomic classes. The people who can't afford to live away from busy roads where the housing tends to be cheaper, they tend to be exposed to more pollution. Air pollution is not only an epidemic, 
is an issue of social injustice. Research from the Environmental Defence Fund Europe shows that London's poorest areas and black, Asian and minority ethnic communities are hit hardest by the toxic air, with nitrogen dioxide in those areas being 24 to 31 per cent higher. The wealthier folk that can afford to live further away from town and commute to work in their cars are in turn creating the problem. Imagine if electric scooters were legalised. Imagine the amount of cars these devices could replace for those weekday round trips. The air would be cleaner, the roads would be less congested, quieter, and those that never could afford a car could mobilise themselves with this cheaper, portable equivalent. A lot of us do notice the smog. It's almost all of the subconscious understandings of how poisonous the air is in our, lo in our locality started to come to the forefront. Like, actually, this isn't, this isn't correct and we shouldn't be living in this way. This is Marcus Tayoba. He and his team at Centric, a research hub based in South London, help to engage residents of Lambeth and Southwark in important conversations of social issues, like air quality. Lower socioeconomic demographics tend to be bundled up in urban conurbations where there's so much pollution going on, but they don't necessarily tend to be involved in the environmental activism to change that. At first, we had to let them know what time it was in terms of they didn't necessarily understand anything to do with air pollution because they historically haven't been involved in the, com in the conversation in that regard. So they said things to us like, how can we focus on air pollution when simple things like paying their way forward in life take more of a precedent, but then with the death of Ella, that kind of woke people up and we were able to activate the community to take interest and be involved. A lot of us started to realise how similar our experiences are to Ella's because there's a fair few members of my team, community consultants I work with, as well as members of the community that all have suffered asthma. One of Marcus's team members is Mohammed. He has felt the effects of air pollution firsthand living in South London. So. As a young child, although I wasn't the healthiest child, um, I had quite severe asthma. From as young as I can remember really, you know, is that heavy coughing, that heavy wheezing, can't keep, continue to, to keep running on with my friends, I need to stop. You know, you go to the doctors, you find out you need these two different types of inhalers, one's got steroids in it, one's, uh, one's just a, a daily one that you need to take every day and there were some days where that was kind of really difficult to deal with. A lot of the individuals born in areas such as Lambeth, um, they all have asthma or respiratory related issues. This is an all too familiar story for resident inner city Londonites, but there are groups trying to do something about it. Mums for Lungs, a grassroots movement of London parents expanding across the city year on year, have been fighting for clean air for their children. Did you know that kids face three times more air pollution during the school drop-off? These particles linger long after drop-off and into playtime, making their environment incredibly toxic and dangerous. Choked Up, a protest group who describe themselves as black and brown teenagers from South London, have been campaigning for cleaner air and how it disproportionately impacts people of colour. And Jali Roman Middleton, a co-founder of the group, went to school with Ella. She and her team have taken matters into their own hands by installing Gorilla Road signs that warn of a pollution zone that breathing kills. The London Mayor, TfL and a group of 100 doctors have backed their call for action to this public health emergency. But you have to ask yourself, how has it gotten to this point that sixth formers in Brixton have to fight for what should be a human right? A very interesting thing which I think a lot of people aren't aware of is those who are affected least by the quality of air and pollution are actually the ones who create the most. Those gas guzzling uh, SUVs, you know, the Range Rovers, all of those that you see. And actually in addition, even in the I would call it the urban locale, um, but in these inner city areas, we find that the quality of air is lower and the pollution is more on the main high streets, those areas that tend to be inhabited by lower income residents. I think the generation which I've been born, I won't live as long for uh, as I could have if the quality of the air was changed, if something was done maybe before. You know, I think. We have to take steps now to really address this because it's, in, in a sense, kind of, I've given up on that for myself because I think there's no way for me to avoid it, you know, unless, 
if I move out of London in the next 10, 20 years, but you know, I've, I've grown up here, I've lived my life here, you know, I couldn't, maybe that would change in the future, but I can't necessarily see myself leaving. But it's about, you know, my children or my children's children further down the line. What is it gonna be for them? Some people don't have the choice, but we need to make that choice happen. And you know, that needs to happen at the lower levels and, and, and the highest echelons of, of kind of local government. When it comes to road traffic pollution, you'd be forgiven for thinking that it's just tailpipe emissions that are the problem, but that isn't all of it. Pollution is changing. So it's not just we're getting rid of the tailpipe emissions and getting more of the other types, we're actually getting more microplastic emissions, especially from tire wear eh, on our road vehicles. And these are particles that have a chemistry which we never had before and suddenly they're small enough that we're breathing them in. The only way we can really reduce these kinds of emissions is by reducing our dependence on car journeys for every trip out of the house. 40% of all car journeys are under, uh, I think it's one and a half miles, a couple of kilometres. You don't need to do that. My mantra is in cities, we need to have much improved public transport. Yes, we can have private vehicles. We need them, of course, for many, many uses. But when you have a vehicle, uh, you're going to have still have pollution. And therefore, we need to reduce the number of those vehicles and improve the public transport. We also need to encourage people to get on their bikes. We need them to walk more, we need them to cycle more, we need them to scooter more, we need them to do all those things which decreases emissions. What if we ditch the car? How viable are the current alternatives? Well, oh my, yeah, into the back of him. What if we ditch the car? <laughs> What if we ditch the car? How viable are the current alternatives? Well, here in the UK, we are already seeing solutions such as rental scooters for that last mile, or even electric buses. Here in London, Waterloo is home to the first fully electric bus depot in the UK. I went to check out Go Ahead's fleet of 300 strong electric buses that service Londonites every day. Mark Anderson has been leading the charge to create the solution. A single bus can take 75 cars off the road, so congestion-wise, buses make a significant impact. Then when you layer in the carbon reduction uh, benefit from electric buses, it's really compelling. So a bus journey is typically about 14 miles in length. So on an electric bus uh, versus a diesel car, you're going to save around 2.6 uh, kilos of carbon for every journey. Buses uh, contribute only 3% of um, emissions from the transport sector. 55% comes from cars, particularly diesel. So we really need government to support messages that says, you know, walk and cycle, use public transport, and only take the car if you absolutely have to. If more people took the bus, not only would there be a vast reduction of congestion, but it could fund more electric vehicles into production. It's a win-win. But let's be real, everybody has their own style of commuting and mindsets need to shift. Active travel like cycling and walking have huge environmental and health benefits, but not everybody wants to do it. And not everybody has access to an electric bus to jump onto work. So a perfect swap in for those single occupancy car journeys are electric scooters. According to the analysis conducted by the scooter operator Tier, e-scooters could replace 5 million car journeys annually in London alone. And if all one-mile car trips across London were replaced with e-scooters, then there would be a 233-tonne daily reduction in carbon dioxide emissions. So why hasn't the government legislated and regulated electric scooters when they're supposedly striving for sustainability and lower carbon emissions? Electric scooters, yep, I'm for them. I think they're clearly a, one of the other ways in which we can move around. What we need to have is good regulations that everybody understands so they can be used safely. And then I'll be very happy. Electroheads conducted research into the adoption of electric scooters last year and found that whilst there is a huge amount of support in the UK for the legislation, there's a wide acceptance that progress is by no means straightforward. Lack of education, poor rider control and safety are consistently cited as perceived negatives of the electromobility revolution, even by advocates and users of electromobility. But that doesn't mean that we should completely ban them. 
Whilst it's not perfect, there's an overwhelming belief that micromobility creates a fundamental opportunity to make our cities and towns better places to live. There's an African-American intellectual called um, Dr. Cornell West who said something to the effect that it's the responsibility of the intellectual to try and alleviate the suffering of the people. So I think electric scooters, if they were able to be implemented with an understanding of cultural nuance and the type of patterns of behaviour of the different um, demographics within the community, I think that they could be, you know, revolutionary. I think there's a role for electric scooters to play. Um, in, in my view, anything that gets people out of their diesel cars is a good thing. It's part of that new mobility mix, which is less carbon dependent. So we welcome uh, all modes of transport that, that help people get out of their cars. So if there is one thing that you can do today, if you have a car, can you make the commitment to not use it for those short distance, single occupancy car journeys? Can you do your part? Everybody has a right to clean air and everybody is responsible. Let's write to our MPs and call for cleaner, greener solutions, put more money into cycle infrastructure and teach the British public on rider etiquette so that we can get electric scooters out there safer, sounder and work with disability groups to make sure that they feel comfortable with them being introduced onto our roads. Because every day the impact of toxic air is deadly and it can't continue. Electroheads, thank you so much for watching. Please do make sure to like this video if you enjoyed it and hit that subscribe button if you haven't already to get more content just like this. And check out our Instagram at Electroheads to get loads of daily content. Thanks for watching.